Hey Harvest, hope you guys are doing well. I'm Joshua, the lead pastor here, and uh, really excited to dive into a few sermons on some of our core beliefs. You can actually find those at harvest247.org. And what I want to do over the course of the next few sermons or so is actually dive deep into those a little bit. And some of the sermons will uh, have multiple um, of our core beliefs in it. So you will see that even in this one that I'm talking about today on the church. You'll also see something about the sacraments and the ordinances that we believe in. So really excited for you guys to discuss these in your heart's homes. And and so here's a question that I want to lead with. Have you ever been exposed to one thing with many different definitions? Um, So let's talk about some funny ones. Okay, Coke. So I say Coke. I'm from the South. But somebody else is going to say pop. Somebody else is going to say soda. So if you go into a restaurant in the north and you say, hey, I want a Coke, they probably don't know what that is. Or somebody comes and says, down here and in the south, hey, I want a pop. What does that mean? Uh, So you say Coke, you think you know what it means, but someone else may think something completely different. It's the same thing with two different names and two different expectations depending on where you go. So three components of that. Same thing, different meanings, depending on who you talk to. Let's say sub. I go into a restaurant in New Orleans, and I order a sub sandwich. They're probably going to look at me funny, because in New Orleans, they call it a po' boy. So if I go anywhere else and order a po' boy, I may get some sort of fried shrimp thing or some other sandwich, or somebody may look at me really weird. Or if I go up north, I might order a hoagie. Or I might order um, a grinder if I'm in New York City. It's the same thing, two different meanings, depending on who you talk to. Completely set of different set of expectations. How about this one? This is my personal favorite, my personal uh, issue here. Tennis shoes. You walk in some place and you want to buy some tennis shoes. If you come to me and say, I want to buy some tennis shoes, I'm going to say, great, Roger Federer has some, Nike makes some, Adidas makes some, specifically designed for tennis shoes to play tennis in. But I'm going to say, so you want sneakers. So we say tennis shoes, we mean all types of sneakers. I'm going to say sneakers, but if I want tennis shoes, I'm actually going to go to the tennis shoes. So it's the same Thing, two different set of expectations depending on who you talk to. And that's kind of a silly one. You guys know I love sneakers, and so that's kind of one of my pet peeves there. There's another word that when you say it, depending on where you say it, who you say it to, it's going to be a completely different set of expectations, set of definitions, and that word is church. To some people, church is a building. To some people, Church is a family. For others, it's a mission. For others, join us on Sunday. Some people think it's something I used to go to. Maybe it's boring for some. Maybe you say church and people say, oh, that's exciting. I can't wait to go. Maybe it's needed. Maybe their expectation is that it's old or that it's new. It's fresh or that it's stuck. It's a place to be cared for or it's a place to expand. At Harvest Church, the role of the church in the world is one of our core beliefs. As a matter of fact, from our website, this is what we say. We believe in the universal church, a living spiritual body of which Christ is the head and all regenerated persons are members. We believe in the local church consisting of a company of believers in Jesus Christ, baptized on a credible confession of faith, and associated for worship, work, and fellowship. We believe that God has laid upon the members of the local church the primary task of giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost world. So here's my goal today. At Harvest Church, when we begin to talk about the church, instead of us all coming in with these different thought processes, and this is what it should be, or this is what it shouldn't be, and this is what it's for, and this is what it isn't for, My hope today is to begin to kind of weave a central theme that at least at Harvest Church, when we say church, we actually understand what it means, 
what its purpose is, and what our role within that church is. So we're going to start with Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This is the Great Commission, or what I like to say is the great mission that Jesus gives. He says the most important thing to the most important people, his disciples and those closest to him, before he leaves, because that's the setting. Jesus is uh, already rose from the dead. He's been on the earth. Afterward, he's about to ascend into heaven, and he's going to tell people the most important thing before he leaves, those that are closest to him. Now, I'm going to read for the first time out of the New Living Translation. I just really like this. It's a little fresh take on it. So here we go. Therefore, Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Right before this, Jesus says, I have all authority on heaven and on earth and in heaven. My Father has given that to me. So therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus says, hey, I have all the authority. I'm about to leave. I need to leave you with something because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to leave, and all of you guys are going to have different expectations of what you're supposed to do, what the church is supposed to do, how my mission advances. And I want to make it very clear. I'm the one with authority. I'm the one that gets to make the rules. And this is the thing I want you to give your life to. This is the thing I want you to be about. And so he takes all these different expectations and begins to weave this central kind of theme that the church is a place that goes, is it come to, it's go to. The church is a place that seeks those that do not know Jesus and brings them into the body. And once they're into the body, the church grows them and builds them up so that they can sit and just be happy for the rest of their life. No, 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 no. So that they can multiply themselves in the process of discipleship by sharing the gospel. That's what Jesus says to do. He's the guy with the authority. He gets to make the rules because he bought the church with his blood. So he's the leader. He's the head. He's the guy that makes the decision. So he says, go and make. So this is a double command. These two words come together for a single command. Go, for some folks that like to go a little bit deeper, is a participle, and some prefer to translate it going. But its position in the sentence before the command makes it grammatically linked to making disciples. So the idea of making disciples is tied to the idea of going or to the action of going. So what does that mean? Going means that we take initiative in the evangelism process. That evangelism primarily is going to happen within the community in which you operate. The grocery store you go to, the job you work at, your neighbor's homes, the people that you associate with the ballpark. Because what we know is that 57% of people come to know Jesus through personal relationships, a connection that they make. And so going means that we take initiative in the evangelism process within the community that we reach, which is another reason why we do Harvest Homes. We want to love thy neighborhood because those folks that live around you, you're going to be able to see them on a daily basis, on a regular basis. And as you build a relationship with them, if they don't know Jesus, they're more likely to come to know Jesus because of their relationship with you. Uh, make Disciples means we make followers, we make learners, right? people that do action. This includes the entire process of a person before they're a believer to the point of conversion and then, therefore, after that. The church and every person in it is responsible for carrying out that's this command. And every ministry in a church must be part of the process of making disciples, of leading people in a growing relationship with Jesus, which is exactly what our mission is. Harvest Church exists to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus. So when we read the first part of Matthew 20, what we see, 28, sorry, 19, what we see is this, is that church is not a place we go to. Church is a people that advances. Church isn't a place we go to. Church is a people that advances. Church is a people that are going. They go and they initiate the disciple-making process through evangelism and then through 
teaching. So what's the means of our going? Well, it's baptize and it's teach. How are disciples made? It's more than just sharing the gospel. When a person puts their trust in Christ as their Savior, they begin to be a disciple at that point. Now it is our job to teach them. Um, in, I love the story. In Jesus' time, the rabbis, those that would follow the rabbi, would have this saying, I want to be clothed in the dust of his cloak. Meaning, I want to follow so closely to our rabbi that the dust that his cloak stirs up on the road gets all over our clothes. That's how hungry they were. That's what they wanted to do. And that's what we have to be. We want to be so hungry to follow after Jesus that we are clothed in the dust of his cloak. And we want to teach other people how to do that as well. And those things are caught, not taught. It's not, well, we'll do as I say, not as I do. We have to model how to follow Jesus for others so that they see that our actions um, back up our words. When they do that, that's being authentic. That's not being a hypocrite. Uh, in a book called Unchurched, um, David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons wrote a book, and they said one of the 88% of people believe that church is filled with hypocrites. That's because our talk doesn't match our walk. We want to go so close to Jesus where our walk and our talk are right in line. And even when we mess up, we say, hey, I messed up. People are okay with that. People are okay with imperfect people. People just are not okay with imperfect people that are trying to look like they are perfect. And we don't want to do that. We want to be authentic. Hey, our, 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 our relationship with Jesus is like our relationship with anything else. It can be messy. It can be dormant at times. It can be exciting at times. It can be fruitful at times. It can be dry at times. We can struggle at times. It's all good. It's part of the process. And so Harvest, we want to make sure people understand that, right? But there's two words here uh, that, that talk about some of the means. One is baptism, meaning it's a public identification with Christ. It's a public action of what has happened in the inward heart. Um, it's one of the two sacraments that Christ gives us, along with communion or the Lord's Supper, um, which is also one of our beliefs as well. Um, that the church is to observe regularly. Well, we can't observe baptism regularly if we're not evangelizing regularly and seeing people come to know Jesus. Um, there was a story in a church right down the road from a church I was pastoring, and they were getting ready to do a baptism. And everybody was so excited, and the morning came, and they filled the baptismal up, and they realized it had a crack in it. The water was leaking out. They didn't know it had a crack in it. Because they hadn't used it in years. We don't want to be that. We want to be a church that is expectant of what God's going to do and that we use, stir the baptism waters on a regular basis because it's something that we're commanded to do regularly. And in the New Testament, salvation, what follows salvation is often baptism. This idea of this public declaration of, hey, this is what Christ has done. This is the testimony of what he's done. So baptism is one, teaching is the other. Learning scripture for the purpose of obedience. So learning, discipleship has to move beyond education into multiplication. Education is necessary, but multiplication is primary. If you look at how Jesus discipled his disciples, he didn't just sit them in a room and teach them for an hour a week and then they left and then came back and he just did that for three years. No, he would teach them, they would go out, he would show them, he would model for them, and then he would say, now you go out and do that. They would come back whether they were successful or they failed and he would process and he would teach them again and then he would show them and then he would send them. The discipleship process is very much hands-on. It's very much, I'm gonna teach you I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to release you to go do that. Because the end goal isn't how much we know, it's how much we're multiplying. Okay, So that's part of the goal is this idea of teaching. So again, church is not a place we go to. Church is a people that advances. That's what the church has always been. New Testament, period of time, any time. The church is a church that advances, not a place that we go to. And as we grow, it gives us what I call a sending capacity. I believe that the church, especially especially looking forward, is not going to be judged as much on its seating capacity or its sending capacity. 
If you go and tell somebody what church you belong to, well, how many people are there? That's the first question they ask. If you go to, if I go to a pastor's conference with a bunch of church leaders, people say, oh, oh, attendance doesn't matter, doesn't make the church. The first question they ask, how big is your church? Oh, well, mine's 9,000. Well, mine's 400. And you feel like, oh, well, that's less, or I'm 200. Here's the deal. The health of a church is not dependent on its seating capacity. It's dependent on its sending capacity. Its ability to build people up in Christ so that they follow him and follow the call of God on their life and they multiply, whether it's evangelizing, whether it's making more disciple makers, whether it's launching other churches and church plants. That is, the, is a healthy church. And here at Harvest, one of the things I want to make sure we understand is that we are not here. We're here to build an army, not an audience. We're not here to build an audience. We're not here to do that. We're here to equip the saints for the works of a ministry, of the works of ministry, like Ephesians 4 said, to build an army that we go out and fulfill the great mission that Jesus has given us. Because even in what we desire to do, it, our desire is for multiplication. New believers, new disciple makers, and new churches. You can't build an audience and build seating capacity. You can't build seating capacity and sending capacity at the same time. We want to mobilize, be on mission, go, have the action, action ready, if you will. And that's what we believe that the church is. The church is not a place we go to. Church is a people that advances. So let's talk about three priorities in this type of church. First priority is reaching. We see this in Acts 11, 19 through 21, and Ephesians 4, 11. God has provided the way so that a person can go to heaven and know it. God has provided that way through Jesus Christ. Christ's death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, that is the gospel. That is the gospel message, okay? And he has provided that way. Christ died to pay for our sins. We can go to heaven if we trust in him. And that truth is central to why the church exists. The church exists to declare that message to the world. And Harvest Church, uh, it's in our name to declare that to the world, to, to reap a harvest. So a church must effectively present the gospel in various ministries and train others to do that personally. I'm just going to go on a pet peeve. It is not the lead or senior pastor or pastoral staff's only responsibility to carry out the evangelism process for the church. Those people are to equip the saints for the works of ministry, for all of us have the call for evangelism, whether we have the gift of evangelism or not. We're all called to, nobody gets a pass. So reaching is an important role, but we have to do it in culturally relevant ways, where the barriers of the gospel, the barriers of our society begin to get lowered. Um, in uh, We learned this in our trip to New York, I just want to say this. In New York, People have a, there's two walls. They have a high outer wall, but a low inner wall. Meaning, you don't go down the street in New York and say, hey, how you doing? And somebody saves something back to you. That doesn't happen. But once you break through that outer wall, their inner wall is very low, and they let you in, and you are their people. So in New York, evangelism and ministry looks like you got to break through the outer wall, establish trust, and then you're in. But in the South, our outer wall is very low. We, we wave to people on the road, and we, we talk to people down the street, how you doing, how you doing? We don't even know them, may never see them again. But our inner wall is very high. It takes a long time to break through that inner wall to gain trust in the South. So our job is to break through the, the wall, and that's only done through relationship, and it's only done by reaching people in culturally relevant ways, meaning ways that they can perceive and comprehend the gospel message. The way we reached people in the early 1900s and the 1950s and the 1990s has changed to today. It's different how we reach people. And 20 years from now, it'll be different then. The gospel message doesn't change, but the way we reach people changes. So we have to do that in culture. We have to reach people in culturally relevant ways. One of the things we did in the Philippines, we flew into the Philippines, flew down to Mindanao, we didn't go and share the gospel. Sarah and I are Caucasian people from the South. At that time, from Colorado. The people in the jungles of Mindanao, they don't care what we have to say. 
But instead, what we did is we trained people who lived there how to carry out the mission of Jesus, how to make disciples. And literally two weeks after we got back, we got word that they had reached an unreached people group up in the mountains of India. So we have to do things and present the gospel in culturally relevant ways if we expect people to receive it. Church is not a place we go to. Church is a people that advances. The second thing besides reaching is building. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. God has given us gifts in the church to build up the body. Why? To equip the saints for the works of ministry. Growth increases our capacity to reach others. It's the idea of building up, of teaching, of staying close to the rabbi, moving beyond education into multiplication. It's this idea of going and being equipped to do that. Um, you know, when you, if you think about it, when you lift weights, the heavier you lift, the greater your capacity to lift heavier weight is. So if you if you lift weights and you stick with 20s for curls for the whole your whole life, you're only going to be able to do that. But as you lift heavier, your capacity grows. The more we grow, the further you will go. And that's why we want to build an army, not an audience. We want to make sure that when people are here, we're lifting heavy and we're building and equipping people to go out. This third thing, we've got reaching, building, and involvement slash advancement. That's Ephesians 4.12. Ministry is not an issue of mere duty. It is a matter of gratefully using the gifts and abilities that God has given us. Because once we become involved in ministry, we begin to advance the mission. One of the best ways that you're ever going to grow, no matter how old you are, is going to be getting involved in personal ministry. As a matter of fact, there's new statistics out that state that youth, that the 25% of youth that stuck to the church after they graduated high school, only 25, 75% went away from the church. 25%, one of the primary things that they did is that they were involved in ministry at their local church with their family. That's huge. It's not a service. It's not a worship service. It's getting involved in personal ministry. So we have to be involved so that we can advance. Because church is not a place that we go to. It is a people that advances. We may confuse a hoagie, sub. We may confuse Coke, pop, soda, and Heaven forbid we confuse tennis shoes and sneakers. I mean, come on. We may confuse those. Those are just trivial things. Things to laugh at. But let's not confuse what the church is, what the church means. Let's not confuse what our goal is, what our duty is here on the earth. Let's not confuse that God has created every single person watching this, every single person that you meet with a God-given set of gifts and abilities and purpose that is unlike anybody else on the face of the earth that can be used to advance his kingdom. And for us, church, our job is to reach them, to teach them, and to get them involved in personal ministry so that they can watch out and our sending capacity is greater than it's ever been so that we can reach more people than we've ever reached. Church is not a place we go to. Church is a people 